believe many of us, we will be curious about one thing, and that is our future. We always like to know, you know, what will happen to us in the future. And so sometimes when we say, oh God, we want to know your plan. In fact, what we really want to know is, what is our future fate? And so whether it's Christian or non-Christian alike, you know, we look for resources to tell us predictions about what will happen to us in the future. It's just that the difference is um, Christians and non-Christians return to different resources. For non-believers, perhaps they will read up some uh, horoscopes. But for Christians, we tend to turn to some so-called Christian prophets, you know, who can offer us certain prophecies in the name of God. But have we ever asked ourselves, why do we want to know certain revelation? Why do we want to know certain predictions? Do we want to know God's plan? Do we want to know God's will? So that you know, we can obey His plan, obey His will? Or do we just want to know God's uh, plan in order that we can devise certain strategies or ways to try to avoid or escape certain plans that God has in store for us? I mean, what's the purpose for us wanting to know God's word? Is it to adjust our plans around God's plan? Or is it to counter uh, God's plan? Or sometimes, you know, perhaps some people, they just want to know God's plan or will out of certain curiosity. Uh, they just want to know for fun. But they totally have no intention uh, that upon knowing God's word, they want, to, uh, they want to obey Him. And so this is something we need to reflect upon ourselves. You know, every time when we pray, we ask God to reveal Himself to us. But for what reason does God... Uh, should God reveal Himself to us? And so today, we will read this very famous story, but uh, it's about how, it's not just a story. Uh, it's the story of how God revealed Himself, His plan, through His chosen one, Joseph, and how heeding God's word led to deliverance. And so today, we will touch on Genesis chapter 41. And this is a super long chapter, so I will summarize the first part of it. For you, uh, we will start reading from uh, verse 15. But between verse 1 to 14, what really happens was um, uh, after two years of um, uh, being forgotten by the cupbearer, Joseph was uh, in prison. So two years passed, and then Pharaoh suddenly got two dreams. And so in the first dream, he saw you know seven fat cows. Uh, he first saw seven fat cows, and after that, he saw seven very thin cows. And after that, the strange thing is the seven thin cows actually ate up the fat cows. And then the second dream is similar to the first, where uh, the pharaoh first saw seven heads of very healthy grains. But after that, he also saw seven very ugly and thin grains. And also the same strange thing happened. The seven thin grains swallowed up the seven healthy grains. And so this pharaoh, after he woke up, he was very perplexed and troubled. And so he summoned all his wise men, but no one could explain to him uh, the, the meaning behind the two dreams. And it was only till then that the cupbearer, who forgotten about uh, Pharaoh, uh, who forgot about Joseph for two years, at this moment, then the cupbearer suddenly remembered, oh, that's this Joseph. And so Joseph was summoned from prison, and he uh, go and see Pharaoh. So starting from verse 15 here, now, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And notice Joseph's response to the flattery from a king. You know, now sometimes you know when people say, wow, you're so smart, you're so expert in certain things. But notice Joseph's response. He said, I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. So what was Joseph actually doing? He's actually refocusing the attention of Pharaoh to God. I mean, uh, Joseph was really uh, commendable in this aspect, in the sense that, you know, he's a prisoner. Now he stood before the Pharaoh. He didn't even think about his own, uh, his own welfare. In the sense, you know, if you are uh, someone with common sense, right, you would say, well, now the Pharaoh needs my service and my interpretation. I, I can maybe nego negotiate with the Pharaoh for my release. You know, if you, want, if you want me to tell you what your dream means, then Pharaoh, can you please release me, you know, if I can offer you the interpretation. But here, what Joseph was more concerned about was about glorifying God. He makes sure that he first gave God the credit that only God, he can know, he can know the unknown. And so he didn't even think about his own, his own things. 
I mean, uh, and Joseph could have just um, just revealed the meaning of the dream straight away to Pharaoh without even mentioning about God. But he took the effort to deliberately point the Pharaoh to God. So this is what a humble person does. No matter you know how people may praise us or say that you know we are really an expert in certain areas, a humble person will always not seek glory for himself but always point back to God. So same thing for us. I mean, we may be experts in our own fields. We may have our own special competencies and talents. But we really need to keep reminding ourselves that everything, every talent that we have truly comes from God. I mean, if we ourselves didn't confirm it regularly in our heart, when someone prays us, we will just be very happy about it. We may forget to give God the credit. But if we have been constantly uh, confirming that every good thing we have comes from God, then when someone prays us, very naturally, uh, we will just refer them to, back to God again. And so Joseph's life is a testimony of how of what we read just now during the scripture reading about how God, he will be faithful to lift up a humble person in God's due time. And so this is what we will read uh, toward the end of this chapter of how you know, God finally exalted Joseph to a high place. And so after these two verses, what happened, to cut the story short, is then Pharaoh reiterate his two dreams to uh, Joseph. And in verse 25, after hearing the two dreams, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, in fact, he explained to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grains are seven years. It is one and the same dream. Verse 27, the seven lean ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. And then verse 31, The abundance in the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. And the reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. Now remember this term, the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. The whole Bible tells us a lot of things that God has firmly decided to do. Every word of the Bible will be fulfilled in God's good timing. So here we see that you know, how God, He truly was above the kings of this world. Uh, we know that back then, uh, Egypt was a very prosperous country. So much so that the king of Egypt, meaning Pharaoh, he was almost regarded like a god. But no matter how mighty this Pharaoh appeared to be, or seemed to be, or believed to be, he couldn't even control the fate of his country. He couldn't even control whether the country will be in abundance or in scarcity. And so, he cannot go against what God has firmly decided to do. So this is the same for all the wise men, all the figures of authorities in this world. They may have a lot of achievements, they may be very smart in their own fields, but no one can go against God's plans. And so what this so-called or seemingly mighty Pharaoh could do was to listen to what God told him through Joseph and to heed God's advice. And so verse 33, Joseph continued saying, And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth, fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. And this food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt, so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. So the Bible also taught us about prudent saving. And then verse 37, The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man? One in whom the spirit, in whom is the spirit of God. So again, we saw you know, how a non-believer can see God's presence 
in the life of someone who belongs to God. And sometimes you know when we read stories like this about how the Bible describes uh, people can notice that God is with Joseph, we also hope that you know, people can notice that of us when we are in office, when we are in our classroom. So if we belong to God, uh, hopefully people can sense God's presence with us. And verse 39 here, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God had, has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. And so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. So it's not, not just managing the palace affairs, but the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will leave hand or foot in all Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of, of abundance, the land produced plentifully. So God honored someone you know, who has trust in God. So God honored Joseph's words. And verse 48, Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and store it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. And Joseph stored up huge quantities of grains, like the sand of the sea. And it was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. And so here we see something uh, that the Bible always teaches us about good stewardship. I mean, it's very common sense, right? He stored up the extra from the harvest so that uh, it can be used during the famine time. So this also points uh, us to think about our own conditions. Now, if God today has been so gracious to give us abundance, perhaps in comparison to people around us, if God gave us more, He meant for us to use it wisely and to save for future use, and not just that, but also not just use for ourselves, but to use to bless other people as well. And so, when God, the principle is, when God gave us more, that means our accountability will be greater. And so, God will, you know, God will, God will test us, God will examine us. When He gave us more, uh, did we use it selfishly? And did we use it prudently? Actually, sometimes, you know, when we read about uh, storing things up and saving, sometimes we may get this idea that, you know, that God doesn't seem to be very approving of the idea of storing up treasure. Because we have heard the Bible say, you know, do not store up treasures for yourself. Because uh, the treasure on earth, they can be destroyed by moth. In the Bible, we also read about you know, this uh, rich fool who had a lot of wealth. And then he said to himself, I shall build myself a barn. Then I can store up all my wealth. And after that, I can lead an easy life. So you know, sometimes when we hear all, this, uh, all these words of the Bible, we may think that you know, God is against the idea of saving up. But in fact, what God is against is not saving. What God truly is against is the idea of trusting in our material wealth. You know, to store things up, to feel very complacent and think that, oh, now I have a lot of money stored up, I don't need God. That is what God is against. And so, here, God, when God gives us more, God doesn't mean that, uh, God doesn't mean it that we should uh, pamper ourselves uh, more in a selfish way, but as what God did for Egypt, it is to share the abundance with the rest of the world. And so, next verse 50 is sort of like uh, a summary statement of uh, what happened to Joseph in between, uh, after, the, after explaining the dreams. So, before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Ashnaf, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. And Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. I mean, I think Pastor not long ago mentioned talk about this Manasseh and um, Ephraim, so I will not talk too much about the two of them today. But what the Bible is trying to highlight to us is in the course of the long years of uh, Joseph's tribulation, God not just prospered him outwardly, he also uh, healed him inwardly. God didn't let the years of suffering go to waste, but God is in fact speaking 
to Joseph and healing him of all his grievances and hurts. And in verse 52, the second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So God gave Joseph two kinds of uh, evidences and blessings. One, he soothed him of his sorrow. He made him forget his agony. And second is the very practical one that we always like, the outward fruit, the fruitfulness outwardly, the blessings outwardly. And so, uh, verse 56, when the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the e Egyptians. For the famine was severe throughout Egypt, and all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph, because the famine was severe everywhere. So it's not just um, uh, uh, an event like this, but it's like a progression of how God honoured his very first promise to Abraham. I will make you and your descendants a blessing to Israel and to all the world, all nations. So this is like a, a, a glimpse of how God is using the line of Abraham to bless the whole world. Okay, so today we will focus our attention on God's revelation. Because we read in uh, verses 25 and 20, 28 that this is not just a story. In this story, it is God who revealed certain things. God has intention to show his people certain things. And what God reveals, God will surely do it. Because God is a God who will honour and fulfil his word. And so now, just like I mentioned, we are always very curious about you know, God's revelation. We want to know what God is planning to do. But the thing is, when we are curious about God's revelation and plans, what we really need to understand is God's purpose for revealing things, things to men, as what he did for Pharaoh's case today. So, uh, when God revealed things to us, even today, is it because he just wants to give us certain information? Or is it uh, God just wants to exhort a person or highlight how gifted or talented a person is? Such as, you know, Joseph, uh, Joseph has this uh, gift of interpreting dreams. I mean, certainly God, when he spoke through his messengers, is not merely to give us certain information. It's not just to reveal certain future secrets. But when God uh, gave a revelation, his intention is actually to motivate, to solicit a certain blessed response from his people. When I say blessed response is the right response, the godly response. And what kind of response is that? Uh, you just just uh, in the passage we read, we saw that God forewarned the Pharaoh and his whole kingdom about an impending disaster of this seven year long famine. But when God gave this revelation, from how it unfolds, we know that God's revelation of this bad news is not really meant to destroy uh, the country of Egypt at that moment because uh, God offered the advice you know how you can avert trouble how you can survive through the crisis so God's intention in revealing his plan for this case is ultimately he wants people to recognize that you know he is God he himself is the savior is God I mean of course here is not so explicit but we can see that even Pharaoh, he knew that, he can sense that Joseph, he is a person upon whom the Spirit of God is with. So what God is trying to highlight is, he wants want people to realize that the God whom Joseph worshipped, he then is the true God. He then is the real God. He then is the powerful God. And what's the point of realizing that he is the real God? His real intention is so that our, we can be motivated to have this response to turn to God, to not just recognize that there is this God, but to turn our lives to Him and be saved. And so, as what we can uh, see from uh, J Joseph's interaction with the Pharaoh, we see that God did not just give Joseph the insight to interpret Pharaoh's two dreams. God also gave Joseph the wisdom to advise the Pharaoh how is the Pharaoh supposed to deal with this crisis so as to prevent Egypt and as well as the whole world from perishing. So the key thing is this, when God offered his words and plans, in fact, for this case, 
there is these words of um, good news and the words of warning. So the, the key thing about getting the most out of God's revelation is we need to understand that deliverance, when God, when God gave a warning, deliverance is only possible if a person heeds and obeys God's word. For this case, it's God's words through Joseph. And so in the same way, the same principle applies today. I mean, no matter what problem we could be facing, uh, if only we were to turn to God's word, ask God, you know, what is it that you want me to do? And if we are to submit to God, God will also offer us mercy and hope. But when you say this, you know, sometimes we say, oh, we need to respond to God, we need to respond to God. Some people may ask, does human, does human uh, response truly matter? Does it matter or not? Because why? Because a lot of people will say, you know, um, no one can change God's plan, right? right? I mean, can we change God's plan? Uh, so some, some people, they have this fatalistic mindset. They will say, what's the point of knowing God's plan? What's the point of telling me what God plans to do? I cannot change. You know, if God uh, decided that I will be single for my whole life, if God decided that I will be uh, without, uh, I will not be a rich person for my whole life, what can I do about it? You know, sometimes people will have this kind of mindset. But we need to recognize that indeed, the truth is, of course, God's, of course God ordains everything. God's plan will surely be fulfilled and no one can spoil God's plan. But the question we really need to ask ourselves is, do we, as humans, really know what God's plan is? You know, sometimes it, it appears to us, you know, like uh, God's plan is as such. And for example, for this, uh, today's story, we know that God will bring about a seven year long famine. So sometimes in our human mindset at a certain time frame, we just think that, oh, this is God's plan. You know, he will bring a seven, long, uh, seven year long famine and nothing is going to stop the famine. And indeed, when we read the Bible, the famine in, truly happened. So nothing seems to change. But the question is, how do we know the so-called plan of God that we, we see it as it is, is the full plan of God? Because to be honest, a lot of things are hidden from us humans. So sometimes, you know, because we do not know everything that is working behind the scene, we thought that God has changed his mind. We thought God is fickle. You know, sometimes God says, I will punish this person. But then later on, that someone repented and God didn't punish the person. So we thought, yeah, God is, you know, God is fickle. You know, God can, God sometimes changes his mind. But in fact, perhaps the original plan of God, which, which was not revealed to us in the first place, could be, you know, God wants a person. God wants a person of a potential problem or a potential judgment with the plan, with his hidden plan to make the person awaken after hearing that, that warning so that in the end, again, according to God's hidden plan, the person can repent, can turn to God and can submit to God and thus avert the trouble that God originally warned him about. So that's why, you know, when, when we hear God's word, especially words of warning, uh, we also need to realize that our God is a God of love. Every time when he offer a word of warning, he always also offer the solution to, to turn back to him and to avoid the problem and find liberation in him. And nowadays, you see, when we talk about responding to God, nowadays, uh, even among the church, we hear a lot of so-called servants of God you know, they give prophecies like how Joseph interpret the dreams of Pharaoh's for Pharaoh. But we need to really understand, when God offers a revelation to someone, to humans, God's purpose is to lead the person hearing the revelation to repentance. God's purpose is to, through that revelation, draw people closer to God and to produce in people a godly, a sense of godliness. And so when people just profess or give out prophecies and tell people, you know, uh, this is the revelation from God, but without all these um, divine purposes in mind to turn people to repentance, to draw people closer to God, to produce in them true godliness, without all these purposes in mind, all the, all the other prophecies are actually 
meaningless. It doesn't serve any purpose. And so we need to understand that when God uh, gave us revelation, it is not to you know, let us just know how our future will be, who will we marry in future, and how can we do certain things to make sure our business will prosper. It's not to fulfill human agenda. But when God let us know certain things that He has firmly decided to do, it is for us to pray about submitting to Him and then find the rewards in Him instead of trying to untwist God you know, to give us what we wanted. And so after understanding uh, the reason why God reveals His plan, reveals His words, if we are someone who already understood God's spiritual truth, what we really need to do is to be like Joseph, to also share this saving news with the rest. Now, if uh, we can say, no, but we are not like Joseph. You know? Joseph, he, he's so smart, uh, he's so spiritual, he's so holy. Sometimes, I don't even know what God wants to do in my life, but Joseph, he even knows what God wants to do in the life of the Pharaoh and in the whole nation of Egypt. The thing is, we need to see the similarity between Joseph and us. God is with him, God is also with us. So like Joseph, if we really yearn to enjoy the presence of God, if we also seek to confirm God's voice to us, God's guidance to us in our daily living, we too can be like Joseph, to be a channel of blessing to people around us. And so a lot of people, when they read Joseph's story, I don't know about you, they may, they may, they may be very envious of Joseph, you know, that how come he can get God's voice so easily? How come he can interpret dreams? He can know the future. He can like uh, see prophecies and predictions. But do you know that although I think not many of us or maybe none of us can interpret dreams here, but we have, a we have a better gift than Joseph. So, of course, uh, it is very clear that uh, in this Genesis chapter uh, 41 and, if in, and also in chapter 40, it is true that we read about how God let Joseph uh, have this ability to understand dreams. But we need, we need to know that that is not the norm. That is a special guidance that God had a special gift that God has given Joseph. But in today's context, you know, when the whole Bible has already been revealed to us, have been uh, written completely, uh, the ability to interpret certain visions, prophecies and dreams is not the default, it's not the common uh, or the mainstream uh, channel by which God speaks to us. And a word of caution here about interpreta interpreting dreams uh, because we also need to understand that not every dream is a revelation from God. If you read the Bible carefully, in the Old Testament, God has on a few occasion, occasion cautioned and rebuked his people against false prophets, false dreamers who claim in the name of God, you know, that uh, I tell you I have a dream from God. But God said in places like Deuteronomy, in places like Jeremiah, saying that all these false prophets who told you that they had certain dreams from God, do not believe them because their dreams will turn you away from God. So we cannot you know, place too much importance on dreams. And what is important for us today is the better gift that God has given us is none other than the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation, which we read just now in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. So more importantly than the ability to interpret dreams, God has now given us the Holy Spirit, who is the source of all wisdom. He knew everything. He is God. He, he, he knows every of God's plan. He knows the future. He knows the present. He knows the perfect will of God. So God has given us something even better than a random gift of you know, dream interpretation. God gave us this Holy Spirit. Now, we read in Genesis chapter 40 that the cupbearer and the baker, they were very concerned and curious about their dreams and what will happen to them in the future. But the Bible already told us what is going to happen to us for our future. And not just our future, but the future of every human being in the world. God, the Bible already told us our future destiny. And so the Bible already told us that uh, the end is coming. Jesus Christ, he will return again. And when Jesus Christ returned to this world, he will do, he will do two things save those who belong to him and judge those who reject him. 
and this is also as what we read as uh, in verse 32 this is also what god has firmly decided to do and he will do it soon a lot of times we feel uh, the end seems the end of the world seems like it's a far far uh, a far far away thing but god has been trying to remind us end time believers that the end is coming very soon god already decided he will do it and he will do it soon of course it is in his timing we cannot guess but god will honor his word and so if we who already know all this revelation of god if we do not share people will have no chance to prepare themselves to respond to what god will decisively and surely do and as a result they may perish so same thing for the case of joseph now if you think about it if joseph uh, he just don't want to uh, tell pharaoh about this meaning of the dream then of course pharaoh and his whole nation will not be able to prepare for the seven years of famine and they they will surely perish and so why is it so important that we who know god's word and revelation and plan share the saving news because even the wise men of the world for this case we read that even the wise men all the wise men of egypt no one understood what pharaoh's dream meant so in other words when they don't understand means what means that they need the answer that only joseph can give same thing for today when the rest of the world when they are not aware when they are not conscious when they do not know god maybe they themselves didn't realize it but they need the gospel answer that we who already got the revelation from god can offer them so and if we do not speak that revelation that gospel then how can people prepare for the uh, lord's day of judgment how can they break away from sin how can they repent and then turn to god and be saved so when we when we read about you know uh, the wise men in egypt that they also cannot explain pharaoh's dreams one thing for us to consider is same thing today is the same for the so-called wise people of the world now just as i mentioned pharaoh he was uh, assumed he was considered to be almost like god back in his time and so he seems to know a lot of, a lot of things and the wise men in egypt the fact that they are called wise men suddenly they know many things but the shortfall of the wise in this world is they may know many many things but they only is clueless about the most critical truth that can save them that can that can avert their destiny from trouble so the wise men can know many many things but they only do not know the most important answer and same thing for today's um, wise people that we see in the world not only do the wise not know the truth but if we think about it the so-called wise people in the world without god they are not just ignorant of the gospel truth but they are also seeking answer in just the opposite direction in just the wrong direction such that you know uh, despite all their studies all their analysis all their research they deceive themselves they also deceive others you know for example uh, after a lot of research now humans are smart and wise after doing a lot of research maybe humans may we may be able to get some scientific information but yet if we just uh, remain at a material human level we will not know our creator god we will not know where we come from we will not be sure where are we going and we will not have a clue what is the purpose what should be the purpose of our living and so sometimes we read you know as a as a result of a lot of human research and study all the wise not all many of the wise people in the world for example they may come to a conclusion that oh evolution makes a lot of sense atheism makes a lot of sense so this is like the result of collective human wisdom they come and reinforce each, other, each other's thoughts they they think that they have certain intelligence and they test this test that and then they concluded that evolution is the truth or they concluded they concluded that atheism is correct we don't need god you know we can survive on our own so we can see that uh, certain a lot of times wise men in the world they as a result of their depend uh, as a result of depending on themselves they just end up in the wrong conclusion that makes them further away from the truth of god 
and such far from truth conclusion. If more and more people embrace that, it will just get more and more people deceived. People just get further and further away from the real salvation. And so because of such a trend that we can observe in the world, if you and I, who got the privilege and grace to know the spiritual mystery, the spiritual revelation from God, if we already know what God has firmly decided to do, what is God's sure truth, and it is something that God will do it soon, if we, if we ourselves we do not share this news, then how can people really prepare themselves for, the, for what is to come, for the judgment day that is to come? Now, just now we read about uh, seven years of abundance, seven years of famine. In fact, if we who know the truth, we don't share uh, that judgment is sure to come, for example, without that information, you just think about it. During the seven years of abundance, people will be so thrilled and so deceived and so engrossed in that safety, in that pleasure, in that security, in that comfort of the seven years of abundance. Some, some, it's a bit similar like you know, now, nowadays people uh, in this current generation, in this current moment, sometimes we don't see any clue or any, any inkling about the end of, end of the world is coming, about God's real judgment. And if things are okay with us, we seem to feel like we don't need God. Life goes on. Life is good. You know, uh, even if there is this COVID, there's a vaccine to resolve things. So if we don't share that, you know, a seven-year famine, uh, in fact, the final judgment is not just a seven-year famine, but it's something horrendous. In fact, the Bible, when the Bible talks about seven years of abundance and seven years famine, the Bible said a few times that the famine that was to come will be so severe that people will forget will forget how wonderful it was like during, during the seven years of abundance. The Bible said it a few times. So it is a bit scary, you know, if we don't tell people the truth. Those people who still feel like they are living in the seven years of abundance right now, you know, they don't need God, life is good, they have money to spend, friends to hang out with, a good job, good career, nice life on this, in this world, it will be so shocking to them, you know, one day if they see that there is this calamity, this crisis coming upon them, and the judgment of God will supersede all the previous joy that they thought they got from this world. The kind of judgment that awaits them is so much more severe that, than the material gains they enjoy when they forget about God and go about their own life. It is so scary. And so, when we know of all this truth, we really need to ask ourselves, what is God's purpose? As I mentioned just now, God revealed to us through the Bible, what he's going to do surely in future. So what is our accountability and responsibility? Now, COVID-19 is just a sneak preview to show us how helpless humans are and how easily crippled we will be when we are faced with a sudden crisis. This is just a sneak preview. It's just uh, not even the tip of an iceberg. One day, if God's judgment day really comes and we didn't warn people around us about this sure fact, we will regret because we didn't do God's will and they will also, uh, they cannot turn back the clock because they have no time to regret. And so when we know all these things, what's the point of, uh, it's not to stress all of you, I must go and, of course, part of the reason is also to stress all of us to evangelize because we have this great responsibility. But another, another thing is to encourage us that even though sometimes when we look at ourselves, we may think that we are nobodies in this world, when we look at our life, we will think that we have no outstanding qualities. Uh, what can we do? How can we save the world? But even though we may not be very remarkable in the eyes or standards of the world, but one precious thing we have, and that is we know the spiritual truth. And not just we know, we believe in God's word. And that makes us very precious in the eyes of God, in the work of God, in the plan of God. Because only those who know, only those who believe, then they can share. So we may sometimes feel, you know, what can we offer? What can we contribute? How can we save anyone? But you just think about it. Every time, uh, so in other words, we are like Joseph of our times. Every time when you look down on ourselves, you just remember, if God can use Joseph, not only when he's a ruler of Egypt. I, I, I like the sequence of the, the, the Bible, you know. 
uh, the Bible first mentioned how God in fact used Joseph when he was still a slave, when he was still a prisoner. The Bible record that sequence first before the Bible recorded how Joseph as a ruler of Egypt saved the whole world. Isn't this very fascinating? Because a lot of times our common sense will tell us only when I reach a certain status level, you know, when I become, when I rise above my peers, then I can convince them, you know, God made me special. God gave me high intelligence. God gave me special blessings, special uh, prayer answers. But the interesting thing is, God deliberately showed us through the life tes testimony of Joseph that while he was still a slave, while he was still a prisoner, and, and just now in the scripture reading we, we, we read, he's not, a, he's not a special class of prisoner where he, he oversees everybody and so he, he got it easier. The Bible tells us he's also shackled with bronze. You know, he's also tied up. It's not as if he's a special prisoner who doesn't need to be shackled up, doesn't need to go through the tor torture. The Bible clearly tells us that he also suffered. He also looked pathetic. He also looked bound and chained and helpless as a prisoner. But God used him in that phase of his life. And so same thing for us. I mean, God doesn't just write a story of a person in the Bible if it's not relevant to us. So we, in our own situation, whatever it is, now we may look very ordinary or our office, our class, our family may look very uh, simple. Or we could be like Joseph. We are like the lowest status wherever we are. Maybe we are the youngest in the family, in the company, we are the lowest of the lowest. But whatever the case, if God, who, if God can use Joseph in his condition, even in his lowly condition, God can use us also. And somehow we are not as bad as being a slave or a prisoner, right? So if we are at least better than Joseph in that situation, certainly God can use us also. The thing is, are we willing to be used? Sorry. Are we willing to be used by God? Because if we are willing to pray for God to use to use us, even though we cannot interpret dreams, but God can fill us with the Holy Spirit and can and God can use our words of gospel to turn people to God to Him. And so when we say if we are willing, God can fill us with the Holy Spirit. I want to highlight one aspect of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because a lot of people, you know, they, they also hear, you know, God, of course, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because being filled with the Holy Spirit feels like very great and very, very nice. But one thing I want to highlight through what we read about Joseph's life today, about what is it meant to be filled by the presence of God or by the Holy Spirit is that being filled by the Holy Spirit is not only just being very supernatural. Wow, I can interpret dreams, I can see visions, I feel these un un unexplainable uh, uh, emotions in me or whatever. But if you look at Joseph, he is filled with the Holy Spirit, yes. He can interpret the dreams also, but he's also very normal and very practical in the way he, in the way he lived out a spirit-filled filled life. Because if you notice what the Bible mentioned, after explaining the mysterious, mysterious dreams of the Pharaoh, Joseph went around and do very commonsensical and normal things. He collected the extra food, he stored them up in the storerooms, and then he distributed them when the time came. These are very normal things. And also, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean, oh, I pray, I've, uh, I'm, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. So I don't need to study for my exam. You know, at the right time, God will give me this inspiration like Joseph when he pray. Wow, I can understand. I can interpret this answer is for this question. I mean, after, after knowing that God is with him, he go around doing what is the thing that, what's the obvious thing that God wants him to do? Very simple, very normal things. And so in the same way, if we say we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we shouldn't be looking or seemingly uh, uh, like uh, being weird, uh, weirdos in our fields because uh, the Holy Spirit will direct us to do what needs to be done. But the only difference is when Joseph go around doing all these seemingly normal things, he did it with God's plan in mind. He, not just, he didn't just do it like uh, the ordinary man on the street. When Joseph was collecting, storing and um, distributing the food, in his mind, he knew about God's plan. He knew the seven years would be up. 
when the abundance end, he knew seven years of famine is coming. He did all the seemingly ordinary things with God's plan and will in mind. So same thing for us. We also go around our normal living, but we know God's plan in mind. We know the reason why God sent us to office, not just to earn money, but to make contact with people so that hopefully through our sharing, they can be brought to God. To God. And so finally, uh, when we, uh, after, after hearing about the reason, the purpose of why God reveals himself, and after hearing about the responsibility we have upon hearing God's word, one very important thing we need to draw away from today's passage is the fact that we need to really, try, really know that the God we trust is a God in full control. I mean, who was it that gave Pharaoh his two dreams? And who was it that gave the interpretation of the two dreams? Of course, clearly, it, it is God. It is God who brings about all these happenings. And if you think about the Pharaoh's dreams, one thing to note about his dream is, of course, the, the fact that all the wise men in Egypt couldn't explain this tells us indeed that Pharaoh's dream is incomprehensible to the human mind. What, what is, why is it so incomprehensible? Because one common thread that uh, joins or that flows through the two dreams of Pharaoh is we don't understand why the strong is eaten up by the, the, the weak. The weak. So the fat cows are eaten up by the thin cows. The uh, healthy grains are being swallowed up by the, by the thin grains, the worthless grains. So this is very interesting. Uh, in the kingdom of God, we often read about the reverse state of affairs. This is so consistent in the Bible from Old Testament to New Testament. God is always trying to tell us that the gospel is counterintuitive. A lot of times people who think that they are very self-sufficient like the fat cows, who think that they are very well-to-do, they are very good on their own, they have no need for God, they are self-sufficient. Strangely, God proved it over and over again through his Bible, through uh, modern history, through our, our own life, that those people who are self-sufficient but with no regard for God, strangely, they are the ones eventually being swallowed up. They are the ones who, who will perish. But, but on the other hand, People who seem to have nothing much in this world, who look ugly, look very skinny, look like nobodies, but if they have God, then they are the riches in the kingdom of God. They are the riches in uh, the presence of God. And so we see that uh, God, some, some, some things without God's um, intervention, we really cannot understand. Uh, what, what, uh, why does it mean, what, why is it that people uh, who seem to be blessed, but without God, that is not true blessing. So we really need God to enlighten us, to reveal to us, then we can understand certain important mystery. And so it is God who revealed this mystery to Joseph to help him understand, to make sense of Pharaoh's two dreams. And one thing uh, very amazing when we consider how God is in full control. I was very amazed when I read this passage again. I mean, this is a passage we always read during, Sunday, uh, uh, during our Sunday school years. But when I read this again, it amazes me that in God's unique design for Joseph's life, I mean, of course, you know, as we read through Joseph's uh, life encounter, sometimes we wonder, why did God, this God who is in control, why did God allow Joseph to go through suffering? But, have you ever, have the, but did it cross your mind, the amazing thing through today's passage, that for the sake of uh, using and exalting and lifting up Joseph, God even went to the extent of maneuvering seven plus seven years of weather, 14 years in total. Wow. So today, you know, sometimes, sometimes we, we ourselves, we pray for good weather. Oh, tomorrow is my wedding. I hope, I hope I can have good weather for El Fresco wedding. Or, you know, tomorrow we want to go, go to the beach or whatever. We hope God give us good weather. But here, it's interesting. God, for the sake of his plan of using the line of Abraham, Joseph, to, to honor his promise that through your descendant, Abraham, I will bless Israel, I will bless the whole world. God went to the extent of even you know, controlling the weather for 14 years. I mean, in order to provide opportunity for Joseph to be risen up, to be honored, and to be used greatly by God. So sometimes we really cannot deny the fact that we cannot outguess God's perfect will. 
because it is true that a lot of times it seems as if we in our own encounter many of times we feel as if God didn't care about us why did God allow us whom he loved to face certain things we would rather choose to run away from why did God allow us to suffer to grieve to mourn to regret but in fact the testimony, testimony of Joseph's life is just to show us that many a times beyond our knowledge, God has a lot of hidden plans, greater plans. But he, it is just that he has yet to reveal them to us. Now, this is how far God will go in leading and saving and using his people. So we really have to uh, admit uh, that as humans, there will surely be many things we do not understand at certain junctures in our life. Uh, because just as, not just our life, when we read Joseph's story, even as we are reading, we'll be questioning God. God, do you really love Joseph? Why, why one um, problem is not enough? Joseph must have problem after problem. Why must you torture him to this extent? You know, sometimes when we read Joseph, we will say, isn't it enough that he's betrayed by his brother? Isn't it enough that he's a slave? Why must you make him a, a, a prisoner? Why must you make him forgotten by the cupbearer? So one problem after another. But even though there will be surely things that we won't understand at the point in time, what we really need to hold on to is the God whom we believe, the God whom we have a relationship with, He is a good and real God. And He has our best interest in His heart. And He has His most glorious plan in mind. He will surely fulfill his plan in fact after today, after reading uh, Joseph's story today we clearly see that today's episode is a clear what is a clear advancement to God to fulfill Joseph's own two dreams now the Pharaoh has two dreams right about the cows and about the grains Joseph himself 13 years ago he had his own two dreams about how he's, he will be used at worldwide level you know his whole family will bow down to him God never forgotten that, that two dreams that he has given Joseph. Even though along the way we may think, God, you are playing a joke on me, you know, you are like fooling me. God never forgotten that. And so, in fact, God is progressively advancing that, that plan on Joseph's life. So if you think about it, if Joseph, as I mentioned the last time, if Joseph was released two years earlier, if that's the case, if you are Joseph, you'll be very happy, right? If two years ago, the cupbearer remembered Joseph. Joseph would be thanking God. God, thank you for remembering me. Finally, the cupbearer, he uh, put in good words on my behalf in front of, of the Pharaoh so I can be released finally and go home. But if you think about it, what will happen if Joseph were to be released two years ago? In fact, he may die. He may die because, because the famine not just affect Egypt. Clearly, as we read on, we realize that even Joseph's own family, they don't have food. They have to go and beg Egypt to sell them the grain. Otherwise, their whole family will die also. So if Joseph get his prayer answer earlier and he can go home to his family, the end result is he will die with his family because nobody will know of this Pharaoh's dream. And if, uh, those who know about Joseph's dream, uh, those who know about Pharaoh's dream, they cannot explain it. So nobody can prepare for the famine. Nobody has food to survive. And so by looking at how God is in full control of this whole happening, we really need to rest assured for our case also that I'm sure for ourselves, many a times we experience delays or what we feel as delays in God's answer to our prayers. I think many of us will think, why God, I prayed to you so long already. Why you didn't give me what I asked for? But from Joseph's testimony, let us also take heart that you know, often when we feel, why did God delay answering us? Let us not get upset too soon. Because again, I say, there's a lot of things hidden from us. Sometimes we thought God's plan is like that. But actually behind that seemingly plan of God, there's many things unfolding behind the scene that God will only unfold when the right time comes. But to conclude, I also want to mention that you know, when we read this wonderful conclusion of Joseph, him from a prisoner to become a ruler, we also need to be very, very careful about 
general, generalizing what happened to Joseph in our own life. Because if you observe, it is true that not all faithful and God-glorifying Christian, not every one of them will enjoy prosperity and power in this life, like what Joseph did. You know, a lot of times when people read this, they will say, let's claim the promise of Joseph. You know, God turned him from prisoner to ruler. God can also lift you up. Well, I mean, God can do that also, like what he did for Joseph. But it is no guarantee that every believing and God-fearing Christian in this life, we will taste prosperity. But what God does promise us is, we will all enjoy everlasting joy when we meet Jesus in heaven. And what God promised is, whatever we encounter in this life, whether it's good, uh, through good or rough times, God will surely be with us. God will never fail us, fail us. And eventually, the reward, the blessing, the comfort that we receive in heaven will far outweigh the temporal suffering we are going through now. That is God's promise for us. So as we read about you know, how God showed his faithfulness to Joseph today and how God really lifted up Joseph in God's good timing, uh, maybe we also need to pray that this God will also show his faithfulness to us who humbly follow him today. So the important thing for us today is whichever season of life we are in, whether we are at our uh, very comfortable phase, whether we are in troubled seas, whichever seasons we are at in life right now, the most important thing for us is, is what? Is to be able to hear frequently from the spirit of wisdom and revelation. One thing that Paul Joseph through his up and down is he is close to God. He, he, the, the presence of God is very obvious in his life. So whatever season we are also going through right now, one important prayer for us to pray is we pray that we can also always and all the time hear the revelation, hear the words, hear the conviction from the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation. And after hearing, pray that God give us the power to obey God and not just that, but to also share this revelation to those people who need to hear it. As I mentioned, if we don't share, how can others prepare? How can others turn to God? How can others also save themselves from judgment? So may God help us in this, to see Him, to hear Him, to obey Him, and to speak about Him. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for revealing to us things that we otherwise do not know. Lord, thank you for once again reminding us how precious we are. Even though we may not have um, very remarkable qualities in comparison to people of the world, but what we have, our faith in you and the, the spiritual truth that you have given us far exceeds whatever good things that uh, people who do not know you have. Lord, because when you have given us this spiritual truth, we not only can repent and save ourselves, we can also pass this on in the hope that in your mercy, God, you can also save others who hear your own revelation, who hear your gospel. So Lord, we pray that uh, you help us be accountable to what we have received from you, that we'll be faithful to obey your word and we'll also be faithful to preach your word. So Lord, we thank you and we pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.